All right, I think we're all back now. So if you didn't get to the end of the quiz, that's not a big issue. It's labeled as an E-class quiz. It's going to be marked for effort, and I'm going to basically give you full marks if you participated in the exercise uh, as evidenced through the answers that you submitted. Uh, next week, we'll be doing something similar for the next couple sections where we'll sort of expect a little bit higher sort of way, uh, making it through the article here. So don't sweat it. You participated. You get participation marks. Good on you. Uh, so at this point, uh, for the rest of the class, I just wanted to go over a couple things, getting us ready to sort of look at uh, next week's kind of data engagement exercise, because it's kind of going to go with our content, and then show you some things in Glue that may help you in completing next week's homework. So the first thing uh, that I wanted to do was uh, just go over and just say uh, high-level details here are uh, that next week we're going to cover sections four and five in this article, right? We did one through three. So then we'll do four and five, which is about the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and white dwarfs. And then when we cover stellar populations, we'll just read six and seven, which have to do with the stellar populations of clusters. Uh, so just to conclude, as we finished up section three, where you're learning all about extinction and the methods that went into everything, the um, main result of that was you're able to set up the Gaia Hertzsprung Russell diagram. And that's what's shown uh, here, except I've gone ahead and I've labeled it as I did in the book with all the different populations. And as we're sort of filling out the HR diagram, the neat thing about this is that the different parts of the HR diagram correspond to stars in different evolutionary states. And for this class, what we're going to do is really focus on what these pieces of the uh, HR diagram mean, these sort of individual clusters. And in the class, we're going to really care about what's on the main sequence here. We'll care about the red giant and the asymptotic giant branch and the white dwarf. Things like hot subdwarfs, kind of weird uh, stellar niche uh, evolution, won't be as important for what we care about in this class, but nonetheless show up in the data set. Um, the neat thing about this is we can do that exercise like what we did with the Pleiades, where we do a lot of filtering to identify uh, clusters in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This is the Hyades and Precipi, uh, which are combined together into a single HR diagram. And what's neat is that they say you get results here. And you'll remember when I showed you the Pleiades, we also got this weird phenomenon where you have razor thin, amazing Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or sorry, main sequence. Pew! Just like, you know, it cuts through data space in levels of astronomical accuracy we rarely see. But then we have all these weirdos that are up here. And if you look at the differences of the weirdos, they're always about minus 7.5, uh, 0.75 magnitudes higher. So this distance here, uh, you can see sort of the, uh, there's this upper envelope. And that upper envelope follows through with the difference between the main sequence of that and as minus 0 0.753. And we stressed at the time, and we'll come back to it, that this is the binary sequence. So the neat thing about the binary sequence is it gives a bit of a spread to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, and so what we see here is the main sequence in this case, drawn here in blue. Uh, and this is a figure that you'll see in the sections that you read. And we see this little bump up here, and this yellow line is drawn at 0.753 magnitudes higher, or lower, I guess, in the HR diagram, lower in values, shifted. And this is called the binary sequence. And we call this binary sequence this, and I just wanted to do this derivation so you're like, that's where that number comes from. Uh, which is, um, if a star has magnitude m, and I want to imagine what happens if I put that star in a binary pair with another star just like it. So what is this sort of total magnitude of the system? And to answer that question, we need to know the magnitude formula. And so the magnitude formula, so I'm going to call what I want m2 minus m. And that's going to be negative 2.5 log 10. This is just the definition of magnitudes uh, of f2 over F, whatever it is. But because it's identical, uh, we have these two stars here that are in the binary system together. And we can't separate them in the Gaia data. What we end up doing is we view these all together as one star 
And so we measure this together. And so if there's two stars of identical nature, uh, then what's happening is that that F2 that we have here is just twice the original flux. Two stars together gives you twice the flux. And so if I stick that into the magnitude formula, I get that m2 minus m is equal to a negative 2.5 log 10 of 2 times f over f, do some serious canceling, and that minus 2.5 log 10 of 2, 2, three significant figures is zero, minus 0 0.753. So that's what this difference is. And this just comes into uh, the relationship that we don't uh, add together, you know, magnitudes don't add together. They're this weird logarithmic minus 2.5 relationship. So if I double the flux, it only goes up by minus 0.75 magnitudes uh, on the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So as you're reading through, that's something to be aware of. Um, the rest of the results section that we'll read uh, covers brown dwarfs and why we don't see them in the Gaia data, but where they would exist. Uh, the giant branch structure, which we'll get into because we'll be talking about the evolutionary stuff on Monday and Wednesday, you'll really see, okay, this is where this shows up observationally. How metallicity affects the helium burning sequence and a bit about white dwarfs. Now, I do want to say that there's this weird corner case in white dwarfs that you should probably be aware of, which is uh, that white dwarfs, much like you know stars we covered on Wednesday, have spectral types O, B, A, F, G, K, M, L, T, Y. Uh, but here, white dwarfs actually have a whole bunch of spectral types too, D, A, D, B, D, O, etc. And this refers to the atmosphere of the star. I thought I had a better one here than this. So D, A, D, B, D, O, D, Z dy. And that just corresponds to what is on the uh, layer over it. So we'll learn that a white dwarf is a degenerate carbon oxygen remnant of a star. We'll learn about a bit about degeneracy as well. No, I think we've already covered that. So that is the actual part of the star. But what we see is the layer on top, this candy coating around the outside of the white dwarf. And the, depending on the chemical composition of that, we see different spectral types. So if you're like, what's a hydrogen white dwarf? This is crazy. I just learned that they're carbon oxygen neon and there won't be hydrogen white dwarfs for another 10 to the 15 years in our uh, universe. But what's actually, what's actually happening here is that um, you're just seeing the outer layers and it just depends on what gas is in that thin little layer. And so a DA dwarf has a hydrogen spectral lines in its atmosphere and a DB star has uh, helium lines in the atmosphere. And specifically the thing that I thought was gonna be on here is that this corresponds to helium zero, which is neutral helium, uh, you know, without the electron off. Uh, if you get DO, I wanted to just point out that that's helium plus in the atmosphere. All right. The final thing that you want to know and be aware of when you're looking at the figures is the axes can change. They're showing you like 20 Hertzsprung Russell diagrams as you go through this article. What's happening? Well, uh, these change to filter different filters occasionally. So I encourage you to go back to chapter one and take a look at what those filter sets are and what they correspond to. So you can sort of interpret these diagrams. So what is a U versus a G filter in Sloan uh, uh, filter set? And I think, uh, oh, there's the figure I wanted. And so for next Friday, uh, we'll be doing a similar exercise as today, but we'll do sections four and five of the Gaia collaboration paper on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams, and we'll answer the E-class questions. So again, post uh, art, uh, questions about the reading to the Gaia article uh, channel on uh, Discord, and then once we cover stellar pops in detail, we'll go into kinematics. All right. Um, any brief questions about that? Because the final thing that I wanted to cover, oops, that's not the right browser. That's the right browser. Can't have you. All right. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
which is if you go into your e-class, the other thing that I've put here is the article, the clusters in the article that are these uh, nine nearby clusters uh, for which we can measure the three-dimensional structure. When they're within 250 parsecs, we get a good measure of their 3D structure. And that gives us these this set of clusters here. And so you can grab some of these. For the homework, I asked you to grab the precipice um, cluster and take a look at it. And so for this case, I wanted to show you how to calculate the average properties of these in glue, uh, if you know a bit about Python. So you can totally just dump these into a spreadsheet and use the average of a column in the spreadsheet Legit method, no problem there. But if you grab the Gaia data set and we use this one dimensional histogram tool, that shows us the values that are in the table data here, which just looks just like the table data that we looked at during the first week of the class. So it had, oop, that's not a table viewer. Go away. Whoop. Table viewer, yeah. So it has all of these tags uh, that we're uh, somewhat used to, except it has what cluster it belongs to in the final column here. And in particular, we ask a question about what the parallax of that cluster is. So we wanna know what the average value of the distance or one over the parallax is. So the first thing that you can do with this, and this is a really pretty neat thing that you can do with uh, uh, glue is you can create these things that are called arithmetic attributes. That's up here. And I don't want the parallax. I want the distance. So I'm going to create a new arithmetic attribute. And that's the distance. And we all know how to calculate the distance now. I'll call it dist. And I'm going to call it 1000 over the parallax. And I can just select parallax. And I just use a solidus or a slash for the... Uh, uh, division sign, and it's a thousand because the parallax is in milli arc seconds, and it tells me oh, I'm a valid expression. It's nice to get validation in your life. It's kind of rare, uh, so that gives us that. And then when we create anything in glue in the data sources, we now have this derived axis here. So I can say, all right, tell me what the distance to this cluster is. And in this histogram, it shows you the range of distances. You have some at 180, some at 205, but most of them are here. So you know your average value is going to kind of be in this range. And if you want to select data in glue that correspond to a certain range, this can be really helpful for the plotting question on this week's homework. You can just use this little selection bin and pick out a range. In this week's homework, I asked you to do a selection in parallax. So you could do a histogram there, and then you could do a parallax like that. Oh, and this shows you how the distances here correspond to the parallax here. Or I could select a range of parallaxes, you know, say between 5.1 and 5.3. And that gives me a different distance because I am incredibly red-green colorblind. I'm going to switch that to blue. Boop. Uh, so much better and legible for me. Maybe not you, but for me. Anyways, that's not the main thing. The main thing I wanted to show you is this one additional tool to kind of calculate the properties of uh, this uh, numerically. I want to know what the average properties of this are numerically. I can pop up this button called Terminal. And for those of you who've had some experience with Python, if you get in our first year lab classes or in uh, 295-297, you can bring this in. And what's neat about this is it stores the properties of this. Can I make this bigger? Nope. In this variable called DC, or a data container. And there are multiple data containers, so I want the first one. And since Python is zero index, that's a zero. Uh, and so then what I can do is uh, ask for the distance on that. And that just spits out all the distance values in Python. And if I want to calculate the mean, I can bring in my numpy uh, library and just say numpy.mean of dc0 uh, distance. And that can tell me the mean distance in this data set, which is 193.98. So it's this neat little trick that if you know a bit of Python, you can it's all embedded in here really effectively. We can do all these other awesome little uh, attributes. Uh, so this is a piece 
that you have, like I calculated the standard deviation of the data there. So it's really pretty slick if you have that in your toolkit already. You don't have to learn this. If you want to calculate the averages, just sort of simply throw it into Google Sheets, calculate the average of a column, that's all perfectly fine here. So both approaches work, but I wanted to show this to you in case you, just to connect up your capacities with uh, the, connect up your capacity with uh, glue. Okay, I got a question here. Do we have to install packages or will they be there? Uh, you do not because uh, glue is built on top of Python. So it comes with NumPy already installed inside of it. Just got to make sure. Yeah, I think we're good. Uh, okay, I think I've checked all the places I expect for questions. Any other questions? Shoot. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, question four, calculate the average distance. Explain, yes, that's the explain how you made the calculation. I just want to know how you did it. You know, did you go into the CSV file and write everything down and then use it in a desk cal calculator? Please don't do that. Uh, that's the kind of information I want to have in there. You're welcome. All right, that's a wrap for me. Um, hit me up if you have any questions on the Discord, via email, uh, uh, pretty much anything, and I'll try to get them wrapped. Otherwise, have a fantastic weekend, and we'll see you Monday in uh, for another lively round of Stellar Evolution. Take care.